This is Michael Easley in Context, and today is a little bit different. My name is Hannah Seymour, and usually Dr. Michael Easley himself is in the driver's seat, and he's interviewing <laughs> one of our amazing guests. He's a subject matter expert, but today is actually our 500th episode. Is it really? Our Surprise. 500th wow. episode. And so I thought it would be fun and appropriate to turn the tables and um, interview you really to talk about your faith journey, mm. your testimony, your conversion experience, how you went from dead to alive in Christ. Yeah. And so, um, so yeah, I just thought what a fun place to start and to commemorate 500 episodes. You started in context of course, with Moody Radio back in the day. But in 2014, you guys launched as a podcast. What was it 14? Goodness. And yeah. you released, I think it was maybe 24 episodes that year. Okay. And then for many years, it was a every other week show. And then in 2019, we made it a weekly show. We started releasing bonus episodes. And before you knew it, we were releasing a lot of content. And so here we are. You know, I don't. Here we are, 10 <laughs> years later, 500 wow. episodes. Well, and, and you tossed a stat the other day. We have hit a million downloads. Is we that did. Right? Yeah, last year we hit a million That's downloads. Crazy. And yeah. That's crazy. So it's been a fun and journey. God's kindness. I know. Yeah. Yeah. So sure. I know your background. I know some of your story. Um, but I was thinking about how powerful your testimony and, and mom's too has been in my life as someone who grew up in a Christian mm. home. And I remember when I placed my faith in Christ, but it's certainly not a dramatic conversion story. And I think... Um, a lot of young adults grew up wishing that they had that, <laughs> you know, um, but but and and mom didn't have, you know, some sort of rebellious story right. either. But both of you told different portions of your stories along the years to me. And I would cling on to different pieces um, and just think about how powerful that is. And so sure. I just want to talk about, you know, take us from the beginning. You were raised in a Catholic home. Youngest of three kids. Uh, my parents, Joe and Marianne, who have long passed um, daily mass. Uh, from the, not weekly, when, daily, daily, daily mass yeah. uh, from their early marriage on. Uh, Dad, when he died, they had been married, I want to say 62 and a half years. Mm. And I doubt they missed three times a year, uh, every day. And Dad traveled for a living, so he would go Texas, Oklahoma, Louisiana was his territory, and he would find a church, Yellow Pages, he'd find a Catholic church wow. every city he went to, and he would go to mass first thing. And um, so we were very devout. Um, Did they both grow up that way? I don't know if they grew up going to daily mass, but mom was the youngest of five children. There were some that didn't live, but there were five living uh -huh. children. One was a, a mother superior of a convent, right. my Aunt Teresa. And then my uncle, um, Angelo, was a monsignor in uh, Ocowaville, Illinois, and Lombardi, Angelo Lombardi. And so it was a very steeped Italian Catholic family. Mm -hmm. My dad grew up in Pennsylvania. He was born in Fort City, Pennsylvania, a very impoverished town. And they were also very committed Roman Catholics. Mm. And in that day and time, you didn't marry outside of your, you didn't marry okay. a Baptist or, yeah. you know, that yeah. was frowned upon yeah. big time. Yeah. So very Catholic. Um, it was the center of life for a lot of neighborhoods. You went to the neighborhood Catholic church. Mm -hmm. So anyway, um, that's, you know, I'm born into it. And we went to Our Lady of Assumption in Atlanta, Georgia. I went to, you know, first one, two, three grades there, I guess. And uh, in fact, your mom and I, I drug her down there eight years ago, six years ago. I spoke at some event. I said, we got to go by Our Lady of Assumption. And of course, I remember none of it. <laughs> I was like, I don't remember this. Yeah. But anyway, so, um, you know, it wasn't, you know, it's just what you did. Like you were dressed up and taken to church. And so were yeah. we. First Holy Communion, uh, all that kind of stuff. Uh, and um, anyway, so we're going to Mass. I'm, I've become an altar boy probably, I want to say, third grade. Okay. And then during the summers, I had to go to daily Mass because Mom and Dad would go. If Dad was traveling, it was Mom. And so I, my ears being pulled at 5.15 in the morning, get dressed, brush your teeth, and we're going to Mass. And I would be the altar boy serving Mass for 18 people in the Catholic Church uh, during the weekdays. But I kind of owned it, and I, I really enjoyed being an altar boy. It was kind of a fun thing. You dress up, you get to hang out with the priest in the back. In the, in the process of Catholicism, you're also involved in a lot of things. You're involved in funerals. You're involved in wakes and novenas. And so you're, you're really engaged in the whole spectrum of life and death. Hmm. So even as a child, I wasn't really – I remember the priest, first time we had an open casket, and 
he walked me over and said, no one's here. This is a suit of clothes. And I was like, okay. So it never bothered me. And I think later on, it's you funny, know, God I've heard used you, it. Well, and I've heard you say that. Bingo. I mean, you know, wow. And so anyway, um, trying to think of, you know, what's pertinent here, but I dove in Catholicism pretty deeply. Yeah. And then by probably junior high, I get into drugs and, uh, you know, it's just common. You're smoking cigarettes one day from your mother's purse. The next day, somebody brings a joint. Yeah. And so for several years, I was heavily used marijuana. I would use recreational drugs on the weekend, LSD, mescaline, speed. I never put a needle in my arm. Bless God, I never was exposed to crack cocaine or I don't know if I'd be here today. Yeah. And all my peers, save one or two, were really into drugs. And so it was just what you did. Now, that said, I worked part-time. I kept my grades up. You know, I was I was a very, high performing yeah, drug user. Yeah, exactly. A functional. <laughs> and functional. still like an altar boy or still I was that that had transpired. So by about eighth grade you kinda you don't do that okay. anymore. And I, I had gone to an all boys prep school my brother had gone to. Steve was a straight A student, very good person, very compliant kid. I was not. I was always in trouble and always mouthing off in school, talk too much. Surprise. <laughs> and um, yeah, it still haunts me. Mm. Um Anyway, the, the, the nuns and priests in the system of Catholicism can really work for or against you. Mm -hmm. And in my world, it was against me. The priest I liked, but the nuns and I did not get along. So in that sort of you know tempest, when you get out of it, it's like freedom. You're not under the heavy weight of religiosity. And there's a lot of, you know, even as a kid that would smoke a joint, we would have an event at the church and all the adults would be drunk. Sure. I mean, what's the difference? Yeah, I know this is illegal, but you're, you're out of control. And, you know, and so it, it was a lot of conflict. Anyway, so probably, um, I think I'm about 15, 14 or 15, I start having this kind of churn about what's true. And I go through this meaningless stage. And um, I can't remember the first book, but there was a series of books I ended up reading. And I won't even, I'm embarrassed to admit what they were, but some of them are like Edgar Casey, Soul Sleep, and some other crazy stuff. And I got to thinking, what's true? And um, there was a, a band uh, in uh, Inagata De Vida was a song, the band escapes me. And I had a stereo in my room with, you know, I built this four speaker system and I'm listening to Inagata De Vida. And uh, it's not a edifying song. And then I put on a Mark Allman band <laughs> it's not album. No, not pretty. And it's uh, called, um, What Am I Living For? Tell Me My Friend, It's All Been Done Before. Hmm. And I'm crashing on LSD listening to all this decadent rock and roll lyric, and I'm going, what am I living for? And it wasn't like dramatic, but I thought about taking my life. I thought, you know, it's purposeless. Drugs, friends are, you know, transactional. I mean, I'm a 15-year-old kid, and I'm sorting through all this nonsense going, this doesn't make any sense. So, you know, it's teenage angst. Who knows what it was? Yeah. Long hair, you know, all this stuff. Um, but at that moment, I thought, you know, you can always kill yourself another day. <laughs> it's not wise to kill yourself when you're crashing on LSD and listen. I mean, even if I had the presence in God's kindness God, to think yeah. about it. When I woke up, I was terrified and excited because I went, wait a minute, I got to figure this out. Hmm. And that's when I went on this mission for truth. And so in that process, um, I'm in a Sunday school class. This is between eighth and ninth grade, I believe. It was called CCD. Yeah. Catholic Catechism and Dogma or something. And this was for kids, basically, who weren't in parochial school. Right. So it's like punishment. Yeah. <laughs> and like 10 of us in this class, and I got hair down to here, and I'm sitting on the back like this. And the first class, Ridley Fotno, brings uh, paperback copies of the Gospel of John. See, is this a priest? Nope. A... He's just a layman. Got and it. I, I knew his family very well. I mean, it's a very tight system. His mm -hmm. wife had died of cancer many years ago. His sons and I were classmates in school. We played okay. football on the same team. Okay. Um, and Ridley was, you know, my parents' age, probably born in the 20s. And um, he writes John 3.16 on a chalkboard, green chalkboard, white chalk. And we read the story of Nicodemus. Now, I'm kind of leaning in a little bit going, this is interesting. Hmm. And um, he reads the verse, and no one said anything. And my memory could be, you know, foggy. But sure. I remember asking a series of questions. The first one was, was, are you telling me all we have to do is believe? Mm. 
Mm-hmm. John three sixteen for God so loved the world he sent his only begotten monogamous son that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. And I, and I followed up like, what about confession? Yeah. What about mass? What about keeping the sacraments? Yeah. What about extreme unction when you die? What about purgatory? And I'm asking again a number of questions, and he kept pointing to the chalkboard. What does the verse say? And in my long hair presence, in search for truth, teenage angst, I went, I get it. Wow. And it was a switch. Mm-hmm. I mean, the light went on, Hannah. And I used drugs three subsequent times. And each time I did, it was more difficult and disc- it wasn't fun anymore. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and the third time I smoked, you know, whatever and got drunk, I went, this is stupid. Wow. Now, in hindsight, that was God taking his hand going, you're done with this. Yeah, this is not going to be a lifelong struggle this. for you. You can't. Yeah. And you fast forward and know my story with back pain and opioids. Sure. I never abused an opioid. I never yeah. chewed one, never smoked one, never applied scripts. I'm going, I was a user. Yeah. And God just said, you're, you're done with that. No programs, no detox. And so, you know, I just bless God for that. So anyway, going mm-hmm. forward now, now I have this newfound thing, but I've become very Catholic. Because mm-hmm. all I knew. Well, yeah, and that's where you were saved. <laughs> so Ridley just thinks the light switch went on. You know, he didn't really have the language to understand what's happened to me, I don't think. The irony of all this is Ridley remained a Catholic all his life, and I don't know that Ridley ever really understood what Christ did for him. Wow. He was Catholic first and foremost, as were my parents. Sure. I don't mean that to be in kind. Yeah. It just there was never any depth in our spiritual lives or mm-hmm. reading the Scripture or growing, mm-hmm. maturing in the faith. Mm-hmm. Um, it was just routine, mm-hmm. religiosity, repetition. And now time out. Just for a second, would you? So, would you say that moment, green chalkboard, white chalk, that was like what you would say? That was that, that was, was the, that I placed my faith in yes. Christ. I didn't understand it all. I mean, exactly. who does? Exactly. Who does? But I placed my faith in Christ, and the Holy Spirit indwelt me no at that time. Thanks for the clarification. Two, two things happened. One, the drug and licentiousness went away. Yeah. And secondly, I was forgiven. Wow. And I knew it. Because in the Catholic system, you're never you never really know. Mm. You go to confession, you, you burn through your prayers. You know, bless me, Father, for I have sinned. Yeah. It's been four weeks, always a lie since my last <laughs> confession. I've lied, I've stealed, I've been mean to my brother. Yeah. Are you truly sorry for your sins? Yes. Say two rosaries, blah blah blah. blah. You burn through them and you walk out forgiven for one minute. Until you screw up again. And yeah, until yeah. you're mad or lust or whatever. Yeah. And so it's this, you know, it's this guilt, shame, what we call Armenianism that you can't have a confidence in your salvation mm-hmm. because you're a sinner and you mm-hmm. always fall. So that's the big, anyway. So um, yeah, so I'm, I'm on this search now for truth on steroids yeah. and I dive into the Catholic Church. Ridley gives me a book, why? Elementary Patrology. What that means is Patrology is the Church Fathers. Okay. So this is the an introduction elementary book on the church fathers. Got it. It ain't elementary. It's a textbook. <laughs> now, I'm reading it because I'm a pretty fair reader. I'm not brilliant, but I can navigate. And I'm reading this book, Shepherd of Hermas, all these different guys. Yeah. They're all heretics. There's a few pages, paragraphs, and then some pope pronounces them heretics. Uh-huh. So I go to Ridley and I go, wait a minute. If these guys are the fathers of the Catholic Church and they're all heretics, I got another book for you. He gives me a book by Ludwig van Ott. It's called Catholic Dogma. I still have it today. Wow. I put contact paper on it with paperback. Big old fat book. You look up penance. You look mm-hmm. up this or that. Mm-hmm. And I have a, it's like a one volume encyclopedia. So you go and it says penance. And then it'll have allusions to passages in the Bible. And then the popes who codified or counseled sure. this thing and said, okay, so and so said this. So this is what we do. Yeah. Now, 99 out of 100 Catholics don't even know this stuff exists. Right. But I'm this weird guy looking for truth. Right. The more I read about the church fathers and about Catholic dogma, I'm going, wait a minute. Yeah. Now, I can't remember exactly when I started reading the Bible, but I know by ninth grade I'm reading it. Okay. And I'm, I'm hitting this fork in the road. Well, wait a minute. It says this, but the Catholic church does that. Mm. So in the mix of all this, there were a lot of priests that I talked to because there are a lot of priests in our lives. And uh, I probably talked to eight or ten priests over time. One in particular, I was in college by now, 
and I'm I'm double dipping mm -hmm. by this time. I have mm -hmm. a friend named Danny File who was uh, God's instrument to provoke me out of Catholicism, not to get me out of the church, but to get me clarified on what I believed. Because mm. I was still Catholic in a lot of things, like you could lose your salvation, sure. you need to do penance, you need to do the rosary. Yeah. Um, and, and Danny would just kind of gently provoke me, had a great sense of humor. We backpacked together, climbed, hiked together. We spent a lot of time under the hood of a car uh, working on each other's cars. And he's a wonderful, wonderful man. And so Same that, age as you, your peer? He a is uh, two years older. Okay. We met at a, the backpacking store I worked at, Wilderness oh, Equipment. He, he was a incredible, he is an incredibly gifted athlete and backpacker and climber. Anyway, so... Um, Danny and I end up rooming in college, and uh, we're building a set of bunk beds in his apartment, and he puts a light on his bunk bed. I go, what are you lighting your bunk bed for? I don't know, read my Bible at night. Who reads their Bible at night? <laughs> okay, I'm, I'm game. So he says, you wanna read together? Sure. So I rummage through and get my new American Catholic Bible out of the box, mm -hmm. and he's up and we're reading Two entirely different versions, of course. <laughs> and we're arguing, can't see, we're arguing about what the Bible says on the bunk, you know, he's uh -huh. up top. And we did it almost every night. Wow. And now I'm getting into men's Bible studies. There's a couple on the campus at Stephen F. Austin. And so I'm hit this fork in the road. And it, it happens probably in high school, but certainly my first year of college. Mm -hmm. I go to the priest at the Newman Center. I go to the Bible church pastor named John Aldridge. I go to I drive seven hours to Dickinson, Texas, to go see Pat Meister. Father Meister was one of the most charismatic, fun, delightful Italian pastors at our home church in Houston, Texas, and uh, he was what they call a Paulist priest. They have orders of priests, Dominican, okay. Marian, Paulist, and they're communicators, hmm. and they're sent to kind of revitalize churches. And okay. he was fun. Everybody loved Father Pat, a little portly Italian guy. My mother was a great Italian cook. Hmm. So Father Pat would come over after Mass, and we'd have a big dinner and lasagna and a little red wine and laugh and listen to Pat tell stories. He was, I mean, he also gave me a lot of pops and swats, <laughs> you know, grabbed me by the hair during, you know, elementary, junior high years, drug me to the barbershop once because my hair was too long. Um, but he was a good man. Mm -hmm. So I thought, you know, if anybody could answer some questions. So I took a big Bible, a sheet of questions, drove seven hours to Dickinson, Texas, Spent the day with Father Pat. He showed me his new parish, and he was so happy because he, he's revitalizing. Mm -hmm. Beautiful old campus, but dead church. Sure. We finally sit in the rectory. They bring us a little lunch, and we're talking. I have my Bible open my questions. Very quickly into it, he puts his hand on my Bible, and he slides it away. He says, Michael, you can't interpret that on your own. Mm -hmm. The church has to interpret I go, okay, I'll bite, but what about these questions? This went on for a couple hours. Mm. And finally, he, he did that one more time. And I slid it back. And I said, Father Pat, I could probably call him Pat by then. I dropped the fathers. I said, Pat, if this book was written and given by God to man so that anyone who reads or hears can understand, mm. I don't see why the Catholic Church is the only one who couldn't interpret it, mm -hmm. especially at this fork in the road. Mm -hmm. And he was kind, but I drove away crying, angry, worried about my parents, especially my brother and sister, not so much. But if I left the Catholic Church, this would be like a Jewish person becoming a, you know, Hare Krishna. Mm -hmm. I mean, it was, it, in, in my worldview, this wasn't just checking out churches. And I knew it would, it would break their hearts. So anyway, um, I drive back to Stephen F. Austin, and I never went back to Mass. And wow. um, in God's lavish kindness, John Aldridge, the pastor at Grace Bible Church in Nacogdoches, Texas, would sit with me, and I would make appointments with him, and he would talk about security of believer. I'd never been baptized, obviously, as an infant. Uh, the head of baptism at Grace Bible Church, and I said, who gets baptized? So I went and saw Pastor John. John, why do you get baptized? Opened his Bible turned to Acts. We looked up every time the word baptism. Mm. We're in a tiny little office, overstuffed chairs, and he's walking. I go, this makes sense. So that fork in the road is now differentiating. Mm -hmm. The systems and the legalism and the 
uncertainty of salvation Mm -hmm. and the sacraments and all these views are starting to fade and I'm going, this is it. Mm -hmm. So now back to 15, I've trusted Christ. I know I'm forgiven, but it took a while to get where I'm in the word and starting to be discipled. Mm -hmm. So were you baptized then? Uh, I think my sophomore year in college. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. It was, Mm -hmm. it was very sweet because went through the class and they had a little chapel at a larger auditorium, a little chapel. I went every Sunday night. Mm Mm-hmm. Seated 200, it might have been 80 people in there. The, all the old saints that like to sing hymns, you know, mm-hmm. and John would preach a little sermon. And I went out faithfully, and that's when they did it. Mm-hmm. And all these low East Texas ladies loving on me, you know, mm-hmm. it was a pretty momentous time. Mm-hmm. So there are going to be some people on YouTube that are already mad because yeah. <laughs> because of the way you're talking <laughs> about the, the Catholic, Catholic Church. church on the so let's talk about it a little bit because we both have people that we know and love that yep. are in the Catholic Church. There are people that, I mean, I, you know, thank the Lord that I'm not the Lord and I don't determine if someone's right. saved or not, but I have friends that I believe absolutely right. know Christ as their savior and they are committed in the Catholic church. Um, so, you know, if, if a, if a friend here was sitting with us today, you know, kind of, how would you be talking right. to them about, you know, well, the Catholic church versus the Bible? <laughs> it really depends on the individual and their understanding of Catholicism. Mm-hmm. Because as I articulated, it's a system you grow up into, or I mean, if you become a Catholic. But um, the problem with the Catholic Church is in manifold, in my view. One is Arminianism, that you can lose your salvation. Which is alive in Protestant churches as well. Some, yes. But typically the idea of a Reformed or Protestant church. Now, the Free Will Baptist, for example, yeah. they're, they're Arminian. Most Wesleyan traditions are, you know, Methodist churches uh-huh. and all. They're Armenian. Yeah. Uh, some of the Pentecostal movements yeah. are Armenian, and that's a fundamental doctrine to me. That's not negotiable, mm. because if Christ's work was not effective, we call mm-hmm. it efficacious. Mm-hmm. If it wasn't sufficient for my salvation, then why did He die? Right. I remember asking my dear mother, who prayed the Rosary, and went to Mass every day, Mom, why do you do that? I have to atone for my sins. Now, I never heard the word atone in my entire life till that moment. And this is probably when I'm 25 with her. Huh. And I said, what do you mean? Well, I have to do my part. I said, but Jesus died. They got a cross on everywhere in our house, crucifix. And he says, but, you know, Jesus is on the cross paying for your sins once for all. Mm-hmm. Hebrews chapter 9, 10, 11. How do you get around this? I know he died for my sins, but I must do my part. Mm. Broke my heart. Now, is my, are my mom and dad believers in Christ? I hope so. Mm-hmm. But from what they said and what mm-hmm. they believed, I don't know. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm going to trust the word, mm-hmm. not this created system of Catholicism. That Now, early on, there was one church. Right. And, and so it's a lot different talking today. Uh, back to your point, when I talk to Catholics, they don't understand these arguments. They don't understand once saved, always saved. That's mm-hmm. a cliche the Baptists say, right. if they know anything. And I go, no, that's a theology hmm. that you can do nothing mm-hmm. to be saved. Christ had to do it for you. Then you get into other doctrines like election, predestination, these things that are they're complex. Yeah. But I was that weird learner, and sure. I wanted to read about what does this mean. And most Catholics don't have a clue. Yeah. Um, now, good Catholics who keep the sacraments, who go to Mass, who do all the rituals, they might have a little conversation. I've talked to some Catholics that hold to justification by faith alone, and they ignore Mm -hmm. Vatican II. Mm -hmm. They ignore the Council of Trent. Fine. I don't understand that. (laughs) Why would I go to a church I don't believe 40% of it and Mm -hmm. say, oh, I like the rest of it? Mm -hmm. Um, So to me, it's, it's it's a doctrinal issue, but it's also... What did Christ say? Mm -hmm. And when the church takes this book out of your hands and tells you this is what the Pope says, Mm. he is the vicar of Christ. What a chilling statement. I speak for God. Yeah. I'm the vicar of Christ. I speak for God. Yeah. Now, he doesn't always speak ex cathedra. And when he does, how do you parse this? How do you make this stuff up? Right. And so the more I study Catholicism, remember, I'm reading Catholic dogma and elementary patrology, and I kept my roots in Catholicism for many years. Um, But you're born into it, and it's what you know, and they're good people who love you, and Mm -hmm. you might work for them or go to a Catholic college, Mm -hmm. and you have a nun and a monsignor in your family. I understand this. To me, it wasn't a 
protestation to the Catholic Church. It was understanding what God's Word said. Mm -hmm. So to me, it comes down to the authority and uh, of the Bible versus the authority of the Catholic Church. That's the line. So as, as a practicing Catholic who loves your church and your parish, I'm not mad at you. I just think there's a lot of things you haven't looked at carefully about what God says vis a vis what the Catholic Church is telling you. Mm -hmm. And they can dismiss it and ignore it. I mean, birth control. A good Catholic never uses any form of birth control. Mm -hmm. That's anathema. Um, I would bet 999 out of 1,000 Catholics have never read the Council of Trent. And if you read that document yep. and what it says, he who believes in salvation by grace alone through it, let them be anathema, anathema. cursed, yeah. go to hell. Yeah. Over and over and over, the, the Protestant doctrines are all lined up in the Council of Trent. Mm -hmm. You read Vatican II, it's chilling. Now, 999 out of 1,000 Catholics don't even know those two documents exist, right. but that's the church. So if I'm gonna sign and be a member as mm -hmm. a Catholic, have you really looked carefully mm -hmm. at what you believe? Mm -hmm. And I get, we already get the email and YouTube comments about, well, that's not what our Catholic Church believes. That's what the Catholic Church holds the to. The universal Catholic Church. Yeah, You yeah, may yeah, not yeah. like it. Yeah. <laughs> and the current Pope's really done some crazy things, yeah. interesting things, and it divides the Catholic Church. Sure. But if you're a member of a local you know, Holy Rosary, Immaculate yeah. Conception Church like yeah. I was, you just go with the flow. These right. are your people. Right, right. I stand before Christ on my own two feet, not because of what the church does or says. Mm. So does every believer. Mm -hmm. And that's the caution I have for anyone in any denomination or any church. Do you know why you believe what you believe? Mm -hmm. Doesn't matter what the Catholics say. Mm -hmm. Doesn't matter what Michael says. What do you understand when you look at Christ one day? Mm -hmm. And he says, why should I let you into my kingdom if that's the scenario? Yeah. You better understand what he did for you. Mm -hmm. And it ain't about your church loyalty to the Romish doctrine. Um, anyway, I'm prattling. So you place your faith in Christ as a teen. College comes around is really when you decide, I'm stepping away from the Catholic Church. Yep. My parents are going to be heartbroken. And they were. I'm going to you know, start uh, plugged in at a Bible church. I'm yep. assuming it was a Bible church. And then at some point you decide to go into ministry. So this feels like, a really, you know, like take us there. Yeah. How, how did you get from uh, leaving the Catholic church to becoming a I've Protestant, worked. which when you know my, my high school, when you became the president of Moody Bible Institute, yeah. my high school uh, buds said that you were the Protestant Pope at yeah, that point. Yeah, so. yeah. I heard that more than so, once. Yeah, it's so, kind of a chilling so, thought. So, yeah. Well, yeah, I was always worked. I shined shoes at a barber shop when I was in third or fourth grade. You know, on the weekends, I mowed yards. As soon as I could get a job, busting tables at a restaurant. I mean, all, and I loved work because mm. we had no money. Uh, my father gave no allowances, and so you had, you wanted money, you work. So I always and I loved work. By high school, I'm working two jobs part time, going to school part time. It was a program I got out of the. Uh, Sophomore, no, excuse me, junior, senior years, I, I was only at school like from 6 to 11 or something, and I would work two jobs. And so I loved working. And in, in these work environments, I learned a lot about life. So one of the jobs in high school was at a photo processing laboratory called 5P Processing. It was a great job. And I was, I was already a darkroom photography kid at home in the darkroom. And I got a job at a photo lab, and I was working at a backpacking store at night. And I loved it. And I did real well, and the owner it was a small company, maybe 25 people, but he took me under his wing. And I worked extra hours on Saturday. We did odd jobs at the lab. And by my end of my junior year, he said to me, if you'll go get a two-year associate's degree somewhere, I'll send you to RIT, Rochester Institute of Technology, which was a subsidiary related to Kodak in Rochester, mm -hmm. New York. And they offer a photo science and engineering degree. He goes, you get your associates, I'll pay for you to go to RIT. Wow. So when I finally, I, I worked a year between high school and college. I didn't want to go to college. I was like working better, like money. So I worked for the railroad full time, and then I decided to go to Stephen F. Austin. That's because of Danny File and George Bocorny, who were there, and they kept saying, you need to come to college. I didn't look at any school. I, I just applied to Stephen F. Yeah. and packed up my worldly possessions in my truck, and I drove to Nacogdoches and never left for four years. So uh, while, while we're there, um, probably the first, because I'm doing this Catholic, you know, fork in the road, I'm going to Grace Bible Church, I'm studying associates, I hate accounting, 
<laughs> because of the teacher. I hated business because of the teacher. And I'm like, I don't want to do two years of this. I don't like this stuff, but I'm really enjoying English. And I'm really enjoying history. And I'm really growing in the Lord. And I'm really involved in the local church in Nacogdoches. And I'm like, and Nacogdoches, Grace Bible Church, John Aldridge was a graduate of Dallas Seminary. Three hour, three and a half hour drive. And he would bring Dallas professors in occasionally to teach. Now, I had gone to Bethel Independent Presbyterian Church in, in Houston, where Bob Tolston was also a Dallas grad. I didn't know all about this Dallas stuff. Sure. Bob Sahlstrom comes in, opens the Bible, teaches Genesis, uh, Genesis 12, the Abrahamic Covenant. Uh, Harold Honer comes in and teaches a passage in Ephesians. Ramesh Richards comes in and uh, Walt Baker comes in and teaches on missions. I'm spellbound. I'm a college kid going, how did they know all this about the Bible? As I say, I never heard the Bible taught, and when it was, it was like someone gave me a milkshake and I never tasted sugar. Mm -hmm. uh, I got to have another one, another one. And so for me, that exposure to exposition drove me into my walk with the Lord and to studying Scripture and knowing who He was and hanging with people that wanted to do that, um, which is kind of a mantra of my life. You have friends that are going in the yep. same direction. Yep. And so by the second, probably the second semester of my freshman year, I was going to jettison the business associates and RIT idea. I still went back and worked for him over Christmas holidays. And I, I told him, I said, I don't think I'm going to do this. He was kind. But I come back to college, and by my first semester of my second year, I started thinking about ministry seriously. I thought about it a little bit, but I thought, man, and, and probably for the wrong reasons. Huh. I wanted to know Scripture. That was, it wasn't so much I want to be around churches and be with people. I wanted to know what God said. And that became sort of the driving motivation for me. So Dallas, um, exposure to it. Uh, your mom and I meet in 78, I think. Uh, we didn't date till after 79. And um, so I, I'm all in by then. I want to go to seminary. I've kind of rearranged my courses so that it makes more sense for a seminary application. Mm -hmm. Dallas was very hard to get into in those days, uh, grades, background, et cetera. And um, so your mom and I get married. I apply to Dallas. I don't get in. Mm -hmm. And that was devastating. And so in God's great, great kindness, I'd have been a fool to graduate in August of, of 80, yeah, August of 80, September start seminary, brand new married in July of that year, mm -hmm. we probably wouldn't have made it. So when we now have a year in Nacogdoches as a couple. And your mom and I remember that year differently. <laughs> <laughs> I loved it. Uh, <laughs> she kind of felt like she was pulled into my world with my friends and so yeah. forth. And I, I think all in all, it was like tolerable, but she didn't love it. We moved to Dallas after a year of marriage. I reapplied, got in the second time. And I'm How did you even have like the gumption to reapply? I mean, why weren't you like, well, this is just not what I'm supposed to do with my life, so move on know, to plan B? Uh, it's a sidebar story, but uh, there were some people in my court that really thought N you, you should be need there. to go to seminary, you need to be a minister. I'm teaching Bible studies, I'm teaching a Sunday school class of 80 college kids. You know, when I'm at grad, I, mean, I had no business doing it, but you know, I could fog a mirror. And I'm getting up at five in the morning studying Romans in my little rent house you know, for an hour every day getting ready for the mimeograph machine to make the outlines for this 80-some college kids that walked across the street and listened to this peer of theirs teach the Bible. What insanity. <laughs> Glad it wasn't videotaped or recorded. <laughs> Goodness gracious what I probably said. And I'm teaching Romans 9, 10, 11. Yeah. Choke that down yeah, yeah, as a yeah, kid. Yeah. Um, but I loved it. Yeah. And I think the enthusiasm toward the text and my spiritual life, people totally. are going... I want to listen to this, this guy. This guy ought to go to ministry. Yeah. So I had a couple of roommates. Bill Pillsbury was very encouraging. Um, anyway, so your mom and I get married. We're still very involved in the same church. She sings in the choir. I'm involved with a men's thing. I worked for one of the guys for a while. It was a painter. And uh, it was our family. Now, we come to, I, I reapplied. I get in. I want to do baby Greek, they called it, first year Greek in the summer. Mm -hmm. So Because the languages take time. So we moved to Dallas in 81 to start in, in the summer and uh, don't know anyone. We, I try to reconnect with some of my college guys. There were different places by that time. Relationships yeah. change. So we visit a few churches, and um, we end up at Trinity Fellowship. 
and uh, they were meeting in a different church while their church was being built at the time. So we were going to this other church on a like four o'clock Sunday afternoon. wasn't many people there, but I knew some folks. And uh, this guy Ed Bloom was the teaching elder, and he was incredible. And um, first Sunday we go, I'm way off kilter. But first Sunday we go, Robert White collars me and says, "Hey, I need some help with the youth ministry." Mm-hmm. You know, and I'm terrified of youth ministry. But that's another story. But um, so yeah, so we went to Dallas, and the the, the good part was now it's our marriage, yeah. not my world in East Texas yeah. for five years ostensibly, and we're together doing this thing. She thought, and she'll tell the story. I thought you were going to PhD and be a counselor and work with college campuses, which is what I thought I was going to do. Interesting. And so ministry took a hook, and I thought, well, I'll do the THM, and then I'll do a PhD in counseling, and then I'll try to work on a campus. At that point, everybody wanted to do that. Uh, so the market changed. Yeah. And then the more I thought about it, I felt I think God wants me in a teaching role, not in a counseling mm-hmm. academic role on campuses. And and that's what transpired in yeah. our story. But yeah. Anyway. So she didn't really sign up to you, pastor's wife. She still she still is a <laughs> bit bitter about that, but but she's okay. Listen, 43 years, I think she's stuck with me. And listen, she she uh, did her own thing as a pastor's wife. Yeah. And she paved the way, I think, for so many other women yeah. who became pastor's wives after her. Well, that and allowed them to actually just be who God created them to be and not what they assumed or what the church really was yep. putting on them. And so... She had a um, challenge, our first church, uh, a lot of expectations. And, yeah. I mean, we're, we're newly married. You're six months old. Yeah. It's the first church I've been on my own. In mid-20s. This is, I mean, I'm, I, that's I'm like... I'm 29. <laughs> I'm 29 going to Grand Prairie Bible Church and the lovely people that were willing to, you know, embrace us. Hire a 29-year-old. Yeah, yeah. A and sophomore, basically. I, I remember <laughs> the first sermon I preached, or second sermon I preached, Randy McCracken, who's now with the Lord. Martha's still around living and you had a great influence in your life. Yeah. But Randy says, well, that's a pretty short, a good little short sermon there, Pastor. <laughs> I got to preach 15 minutes, you know, I was like, Urgh. and uh, I was an idiot for five years, but they, they were patient with me. But there were people that had expectations on your mom. Yeah. She didn't want to be a pastor's wife. Right. Her world of the Baptist church, they had big hair, the low heeled shoes, played the piano, mm-hmm. sang in a choir, yeah. cooked. Yeah. And that was not what she wanted to do. Yeah. Now, she didn't really have an identity mm-hmm. in that world. Mm-hmm. But it was when we went to Emmanuel, and that would have been 93, mm-hmm. Nancy Welch, who was the uh, worship pastor's wife, and Vicki Nellis mm-hmm. were very, very encouraging to your mom. Mm-hmm. And and Nancy is just kind of all out there. She's funny. She's a tad irreverent. She's got a great sense of humor. She loves people like crazy. Yeah. And your mom's seeing, and, and they had a lot more presence there because they'd been there a long time, yeah. big ministry that Bob shepherded huge ministry and um so she was very respected but she was a nut and everybody <laughs> loved it about uh-huh. her and your mom's going i don't have to be this expectation of a pa-. and mm-hmm. the other thing was it was a large staff we had 12 pastors so the pastor's wives weren't Lots as pastors profiled wives. yeah as they are in a smaller church where you're the senior pastor's wife yeah. Yeah. so emmanuel was a towering blessing for both of us and yeah. Vicki and Ellis really poured into your mom mm. which is why she ended up in real estate so mm. if it's my Floyd and Howard Hendricks in my life yeah it's you know Nancy Welch freeing her and Vicki and Ellis mentoring her that you can be a mom and a wife and a business person too mm-hmm. and uh, so we owe great debts of mm. gratitude to mm. so many people at Emmanuel mm. and then much more stories there yeah so to wrap, we don't have a ton of time left, but I want to kind of talk about the power of testimony. And I'm sure I learned this, you know, a dozen times over growing yep. up. But the truth is that it really didn't like stick with me until I was in a small group that you and mom led talking about when you go to share your faith right. with a new friend or, you know, someone that that you're not sure where they are spiritually one of the best places to start is your own right. testimony. And so I just kind of wanted you to talk about that a little bit. So we talk about it before, during, and after. And we look at Paul with Agrippa, for example. And this is what it was like before. And this is what happened during and now after. And so to condense my 
45 minute yeah but you, that you ramble did. that's here. exactly what you did you know it's you know before i knew christ i was a, a religious kid in a system of do's and don'ts that i thought might get me to heaven i was also heavily involved in a drug culture and i had this moment where what am i doing a crisis of faith if you want to call it and in that moment it wasn't an epiphany it was a process yeah. um during this process i'm reading crazy books i'm starting to read good books i'm starting to ask questions of people that i thought were religious people who could help me and i'm being driven back is this the word of god or what good people tell me what mm-hmm. i'm supposed to believe and for me that was the during fork in the road and you know some people have a date and time and i kind of do in at 15 in that class mm-hmm. but i didn't cement my faith until later. Sure. And that's when I left the Catholic Church and really understood what it meant to grow in Christ. Mm -hmm. Afterwards, I knew I was forgiven. I knew what sin was loud and clear, even though Catholicism can make us guilty and shame us. Um, You'll never meet a Catholic that doesn't admit they're a sinner. Right. (laughs) You'll never meet a Catholic that doesn't deal with guilt and shame. And the remedy is what's elusive Mm -hmm. and now i had a remedy Mm -hmm. it's what he did on my behalf instead Mm -hmm. of me in my place Mm -hmm. that's the remedy Mm -hmm. and so christ is off that cross Mm -hmm. not in the protestant world in the biblical world he's off the cross he's ascended so to me before you know lost religious drugs during a search for meaning and truth and god's kindness he introduced me to the savior Mm -hmm. and after forgiven um Still a lot of guilt and shame, but I have a remedy for Mm -hmm. it, what Christ did for me, not what I do for myself. Mm -hmm. And then the growth in Christ and the blessings Mm -hmm. that God has poured into this old sinner's life are inestimable and remarkable. So if if you don't know Christ, he loves you. He doesn't care what your condition is. He doesn't care what you've done or do. He is interrupting your life that he lived, died, was buried, came back from the dead. Mm -hmm. And any and all who put their trust in Christ and Christ alone Mm -hmm. are given eternal life, forgiveness of sins, and begin a new relationship. It's not a religious system of do's and don'ts of any church or system. It's a relationship with the person and work of Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm. Am I more like Christ? Am I loving people, loving him, serving him? Do I wake up going, this this ain't about me. Mm -hmm. It's about Christ and how I live. And so for me, um, it, it's the work of God and his kindness. Mm. I wasn't good. I wasn't good enough. Mm. But he was good enough mm-hmm. to come and die for us. And that's, you know, to the cross I cling. Yeah, yeah. Praise God. Save life, change life. Look at 500 episodes. <laughs> <laughs> In 43 years. But of a, trying, lot, a lot more. God, uh, has, God has done a lot more through you to, and your life than, than just these simple 500 episodes. But, try and clear up my own theology and help but, other people. You know, it's pretty powerful to think that that one changed life, and I'm not talking about you anymore, just, just anyone. The Lord chooses a person, a changed life, and all that he can do through that one yep. person. Yep. And I think we underestimate. You know what he has done, what he is doing, what he will do. Yeah. Uh, pretty amazing. Well, you think of the people we esteem. You know, whether it's D.L. Moody or whatever, the Kimball Room, the story of a working uh, working in a shoe sure. store. You know, I mean, the guy who shared Christ with Billy Graham, go down the line, and we look at these iconic people. But the people who were behind the scenes really are the ones That's who right. you know God used right. to push the 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 storyline. Yeah. But um, yeah. it's a pretty amazing tapestry. Yeah, it really is. It really is. All right. Well, this has been Michael Easley in Context. (laughs) We'll see you guys next week.